Um, it's a pleasure being here with you, with every one of you, um, being amongst the colleagues, I, I believe. Um, just like um, Cristiano said, I'm from Nigeria uh, in West Africa. Um, Nigeria is a giant of Africa, actually, so you can imagine what term we use for West Africa. I know that was a joke, by the way, but um, Nigeria, I think, uh, boasts of uh, more than half of the population of uh, West Africa, which is estimated at about 400 million. We have a little over 200 million Nigerians. So um, I've been a freelance conference interpreter on and off for the past uh, 20 years. And um, I was originally a classroom teacher. I thought that was what I wanted to do with my life until I walked into the booth one morning and then it was love at uh, first sight. Chemistry was very strong. And uh, so here we are 20 years later, I started off as a gray market practitioner, uh, what we call gray market around here, that is without any formal training. Uh, but today I'm a trained interpreter and a member of AIC. And so once again, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be in your midst. Thank you very much, Ian, with whom I've been communicating for um, a long time. Um, thank you for your patience. Sometimes I just uh, go under the radar uh, for a couple of days. So sorry for delaying your mails sometimes. Um, it wasn't intentional. Um, okay. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, talk about the challenges and prospects of conference interpreting in West Africa. And as we discussed at the initial stage of um, our preparations, I'm also going to talk briefly about um, um, AIC. Of course, you are all aware of what AIC stands for, but I thought maybe I could uh, blend the two and discuss how AIC has helped in ensuring professionalism in the profession on the West African uh, sub-region and the West African market uh, precisely. Okay, first of all, before I continue, I'd like to um, send out this disclaimer to say that I am not speaking on behalf of any organization even though I might be mentioning a number of organizations repeatedly, but I'm not speaking for anyone and neither am I speaking for AIC. I'm going to share my personal experience that um, uh, spans uh, across 20 years of uh, practice on the West African sub-region. Uh, this is going to be my presentation plan. I'm first of all going to give you a brief introduction and background and why uh, the choice of West Africa. And then I'm going to talk a little about the political map of West Africa and then regional integration. And then we'll look at uh, sub-regional bodies, um, which are largely recruiters of interpreters and then we'll talk about the challenges of conference interpreting and the prospects for conference interpreting in the South Africa, the West African sub-region, and then the role of AIC uh, in um, helping the inter integration drive of the West African sub-region and how that has impacted the West African market. And then I'll conclude. Okay, so when we, we are going to talk about the historical background of the introduction. And I'd like to start by saying, unlike uh, places like um, Europe and the United States, and perhaps uh, Europe in particular, uh, because of uh, the diverse linguistic uh, background that they have or history, um, when you talk about the West African market, uh, you are talking about the post-independence, uh, the post-independence uh, area um, era, that is the post-colonial era, and that would start somewhere 
um, around 1960, when most African countries in general and West African countries in particular got their independence. And so, of course, prior to then, the colonial powers handled whatever there was to handle. But then, uh, even during the colonial period, we had ex uh, experience of um, local interpreters who helped the colonial powers to move around. And uh, of course, um, people, a lot of African writers mentioned that if I cite Chinua Achebe, for instance, a Nigerian uh, writer of uh, English literature, uh, he did a talk at length about interpreters and sometimes in, uh, in humorous terms, you know, as they helped the colonial powers, the district officers to communicate with the locals. And so, um, we could see perhaps that was the direct input or participation of uh, the local people uh, in um, the interpreting um, profession. And so after independence, of course, when the colonial powers drew, the, the people who were fortunate enough to have gotten some sort of formal education uh, now took over and we are acting both as uh, the executive, that is members of government, as uh, well as interpreters. What helped really was uh, the fact that most uh, people who moved around West Africa uh, in one form or the other bilingual, uh, specifically in English and French. At the beginning, then Portuguese, of course, became more and more prominent. And so it's very easy, perhaps because of the common borders that most countries share. If you look at the map of Nigeria, for instance, you see that Nigeria being an English speaking country is surrounded by, think about five Francophone countries, if I'm not mistaken. So it's very easy for Nigerians to be bilingual and vice versa. And so we had our pioneer interpreters, many of whom worked with the presidents uh, of their countries. For instance, if you talk about um, people like uh, Aviano Achakobe, for instance, who was there at the birth of ECOWAS in 1975. You talk about um, the late president, Eadema of Togo, uh, his personal interpreters, um, uh, Bonin, uh, who is of blessed memory. Uh, you have people like uh, Bruce Afi, who worked with uh, then Ghanaian President Kwame Nkrumah. So all these uh, um, are some of the pioneers of conference interpreting within the West African sub-region. Many of them are gone, but uh, their legacy still remain. And so after that, uh, with the establishment of uh, ECOWAS, uh, most of these people headed the um the the drive the the that is the process of promoting the um profession of conference interpreting uh within the west african sub-region and to start with it was a very difficult time because um not just conference interpreting but Afri west africa in particular, was still trying to find its feet shortly after independence. So virtually every sector was underdeveloped and uh, the conference interpreting profession was not an exception. And so there was a struggle in order to get recogn recognition uh, of the profession within the sub-region. So why West Africa? Why are we so particular about West Africa? Um, basically, in terms of um, integration, uh, West Africa so far has been recorded to be among the most successful regional economic community um, on the African continent. Uh, it's very popular uh, for reasons that I'm going to talk about um, later on. Uh, it is uh, richly endowed in both human and natural resources. Um, it is a potentially very rich and strong sub-region. And uh, it is one of the sub-regions that um, 
is working around the clock to ensure the promotion of integration. And so because of this integration, then you can't rule out the possibility or uh, the prospect of uh, interpreting uh, being uh, entrenched, I mean, as a profession. So like I did say, um, West Africa is naturally endowed. You have a very rich ecology and biodiversity. You have a lot of um, uh, mineral resources, solid mineral resources, uh, which unfortunately has led to what is um, termed as the, the resource curse. Um, I'm sure most of you are aware perhaps of uh, the civil wars in Liberia and uh, Sierra Leone. And uh, today, because of these um, resources, uh, many countries, including my country, um, are targets of uh, terrorist uh, attacks because um, uh, terrorists thrive in an environment of chaos. And so if they, uh, for them to mine these resources, they create some sort of chaos within the communities, killing, looting, maiming, um, in order to have their way. So uh, that's what is happening in West Africa and several countries are actually involved. And so West Africa, like I did say, is um, a very richly endowed sub-region. The population is estimated at about um, 400 million, which is uh, roughly 5.1% of uh, the global population. And so you can see that's a huge market. It's a, it's a really huge market for whatever it is, 400 million. And for Africa, really, that's uh, quite something because most of um, uh, the West African countries are largely made up of, I mean, have very low population, some as low as 10 million, and even uh, less than 500,000 in some cases. So like I did mention earlier, West Africa is the most successful regional economic community of all the uh, sub-regions on the African continent. And this has been attested to by uh, both uh, financial and technical partners of uh, the various sectors of human endeavor. So like I did say, um, there are ample business opportunities for uh, the West African sub-region. You can see the map around here, um, starting from um, Mauritania and um, a little down, you have Senegal, and then all the way, you have those countries, Mali, all the Guineas, uh, you have Burkina Faso, and then down to Nigeria, which borders West Africa with uh, Central Africa. So this is the location uh, of uh, West Africa um, on the African continent. And as I did explain earlier, um, when you look at the borders, of most West African countries, you find a particular ethnic group, for instance, in several countries. Why? Because the borders as demarcated by the colonial powers uh, were artificial. And so you have um, a situation where you have relations living across the border. And particularly in the case of Gambia and Senegal, for instance, um, I remember one time I was working on a consecutive um, session and the speaker said, um, talking about Senegal and Gambia, the speaker said, um, a Gambian is a Senegalese who speaks English while a Senegalese is a Gambian who speaks French. So the borders are sometimes um, very difficult to identify. And you have um, a relatively acceptable transportation system. And like I did say, the population is um, diverse, heterogeneous, and the geography too is rich because you have the Sahel, and then you have the wetlands towards the coast. And uh, you also have, um, uh, of course, you have landlocked countries, you have countries that have access to the sea and so on and so forth. So that makes uh, West Africa unique. 
Um, so, like I did mention, ECOWAS was um, created solely to integrate the peoples of West Africa. Now, how is this integration going to be done? Um, that was why ECOWAS was established. And ECOWAS is the Economic Community of West African States. And it was established to bring the West African people together uh, because um, the, the uh, political class then, uh, the countries then uh, saw the potential of, uh, the, uh, of the sub region, therefore decided that in order to harness uh, the resources of uh, the sub region, um, there was need for all those countries to come together, especially since they all shared a common history. And so um, we are going to talk about sub-regional bodies uh, because um, these bodies are very key to integration uh, for within the South Africa, the West African sub-region. And these are the drivers of integration, uh, really. And the first on the list, topping the list, is uh, the Economic Community of West African State, uh, which is made up of 15 out of uh, 16 uh, member states uh, of uh, the sub region. Um, the Economic Community of West African State is headquartered in Abuja, Nigeria. And in Abuja, you have uh, the three main institutions you have the economic, uh, the ECOWAS Commission. Um, and then you also have the ECOWAS Parliament. And then you have the Community Court of Justice. They are all situated within the same neighborhood in Abuja, the capital. And then you also have uh, the UMOA, uh, which in French is uh, Union Economique et Monétaire uh, de, des États de l'Afrique uh, Occidentale. So it's the Economic and Monetary Union. This particular body, UMOA, is uh, solely for the French speaking countries of um, the sub region. And so you can see you have the UMOA, you have ECOWAS. Uh, automatically, you know that there will be need for some uh, for interpreting because um, education is still largely not um, as, as, I mean, available for the people of the sub region. And so even those who are educated, um, not all of them are bilingual. So uh, there is high need for uh, conference interpreters uh, on the sub region. Another body that is uh, prominent that was um, given birth to not long ago is the G5 Sahel. Uh, this one was created basically as a security organ. It's made up of just five countries. It includes some countries of uh, the West African sub region and uh, it includes uh, Chad too. Chad, you know, is in Central Africa, but uh, it also shares borders, like I did say, with Nigeria and um, Niger Republic. And so that makes uh, Chad a key stakeholder uh, within the, sub, uh, the West African sub region. So you must be aware of the constant security breaches on the uh, sub region. Uh, you know that uh, West Africa is home to a large number of terrorist organizations um, like uh, ISWAP, as Islamic State on the West African Peninsula. You have um, uh, Boko Haram, you have uh, so many terrorist organizations operating uh, between West and Central Africa involving Chad and Cameroon. And so the G5 Sahel was uh, set up basically to uh, try and counter the activities of um, uh, these terrorist organizations. You also have the censored. Uh, the censored uh, is headquartered in Libya. Is the economic community uh, of uh, Sahel and West African states, but uh, is abbreviated to mean censored. Uh, it um, it's uh, made up of uh, some countries from North Africa, um, Libya, uh, Egypt, uh, Algeria and um, a number of West African countries too are involved. Um, I'm fortunate to uh, work for 
I censored a number of occasions. I've worked for G5 Sahel. I work regularly for the ECOWAS. And uh, so I know that um, uh, they are a, one of the key recruiters of uh, conference interpreters on the uh, sub-region. You also have the Niger Basin Authority um, headquartered in the Republic of Niger. The Niger Basin Authority basically is a body that was created to harness the um, water potentials of the sub-region. And uh, it is made up of um, a number of countries uh, involving Cameroon and Chad. But then Nigeria is also involved, goes all the way to Mali, uh, because that covers both the Niger and Benue rivers. And so um, this is also one of the key recruiters of conference interpreters within the sub-region. You also have the Lake Chad Basin Commission, LCBC. Uh, it also involves a number of Central and West African countries, uh, notably Nigeria and uh, Niger. But then um, it's largely populated by Central African countries, Chad, Cameroon, and Congo because of the Congo River, uh, which extends all the way to the Lake Chad Basin. So they frequently require the services of conference interpreters. <clears throat> now, the African Finance and Development Bank might not be solely West African, it's a continental body, but uh, it is domiciled in Abidjan, which is in West Africa. And so uh, this is one of the key recruiters of conference interpreters, uh, one of the largest recruiters actually of conference interpreters within the sub-region and a lot of colleagues are very happy to, to work there. Um, I'm yet to uh, make any breakthrough into that market yet, but I hope that uh, with time um, that will be a possibility. And last but not the least is the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat. Uh, you know, this body is a brand new body, I believe established a little over a year ago and it is headquartered in um, Accra, in Ghana. And Ghana currently is the chair of the West African, of the economic community of West African state. And so this uh, has added to uh, the market for conference interpreters within the sub-region. Now we are going to talk about the challenges to conference interpreting. And uh, the first one straight away is either non-recognition or very low recognition of the profession. And I'm going to be very frank with you, even some professors, university professors, are uh, unaware of the existence uh, of the profession, a lot of them, I mean, up to today. And um, the general public too, uh, finds it very difficult to understand what a conference interpreter is all about. And um, I'll give you an example. I was in Lagos, I think about um, a couple of years and I met, I was introduced to someone and I introduced myself as a conference interpreter. So the lady looked puzzled and um, I could see she was itching to ask a question. Then she, um, she couldn't contain it any longer. So she now said, I don't understand. Is it that you interpret people's dreams or what? And now that, and that lady is uh, educated. Now you can imagine the, the lack of recognition of uh, what we do. Um, I was also um, in Kaduna some years ago when a military academy set up, um, uh, I mean, was um, organizing an international conference. It's a military academy. And so they are expecting about a thousand participants. And so I got there and met the organizer who is a naval officer. And I got there four days at a time because that was um, the day I, I got wind of um, that uh, conference holding. And this guy just dropped everything in his hands, looked at me, as if I just landed from another planet 
and said, I'm sure it was God that sent you because you just saved me a huge embarrassment. He now took me to the provost of the academy, uh, who is a professor, and he introduced me as a conference interpreter. And the man looked at me and said, well, uh, we don't have a budget for that. In any case, he said, what do you people do? Um, even if we ask you to come and cover this event, he said, we have um, about, we are expecting about a thousand participants. How are you going to work? Are you going to whisper in the ear of uh, a thousand people? And that's a professor. So clearly he had no idea what conference interpreters do. Um, so that is it. But up to today, really, um, it's still the case is largely the same. Last year, I was working in Abuja, and as um, break, um, the coffee break was announced, and we all stepped out of the booth. A professor, a gentleman, walked in and said, Excuse me, he was addressing us, said, Where is the machine that was uh, interpreting for us a short while ago? So that is it. That is it. You see, a lot of people uh, know very little about the professional, professional conference interpreter. Now you also have the influx of charlatans, or what you call the gray market operators. These are people who just happen to be bilingual, but who parade themselves as conference interpreters. Um, surprisingly, and funny enough, um, a lot of them end up with uh, the juiciest contracts on the market. Somehow they seem to know their way around uh, better than we the professionals. And you know how it is in Africa um, with uh, the very low literacy level. And then there is very little regulation everywhere. Everywhere there is very little uh, regulation, if any at all. So sometimes contracts are secured on the basis of first come, first serve, or even depending on who you know. And so all they need to know is you speak a little French. That's enough. You have a brother, a cousin, an uncle who works uh, in government or somewhere. That's enough to give you um, contracts. And so it's a very, very big problem because um, Due to the activities of these uh, gray market operators, a lot of people coming from outside of the sub-region, let's say from Europe or the States, um, a lot of them actually do not believe that there are competent conference interpreters on the sub-region. And so some of them, when um, citing meetings in West Africa, and I believe this does not apply to, this applies to other um, regions of the continent. They come with their own interpreters because many of them, I mean, have been coming to Africa, um, West Africa in particular. And so they've only met this, um, what I call charlatans or the gray market operators. And without any formal training, you, you have a good idea you know, the kind of service that they render is usually very, very poor. They are not trained. And so these people feel that uh, perhaps West Africa is uh, uh, full of only gray market operators, which is not the case. Uh, corruption, I already mentioned it. All you need to do is to know someone, perhaps who knows someone, and maybe speak a little French just to convince someone to give you a job. And sometimes very sensitive jobs, very, very sensitive meetings. Um, I leave it to your imagination how some of these meetings end. But then um, who cares at the end of the day because um, the, due to diplomatic reasons, um, the participants might not ex, I mean, complain, but um, they leave unsatisfied because of the poor com I mean, quality of uh, uh, interpreting. Now challenges to conference interpreting uh, prior to now, we had a challenge of uh, training. Um, training was unavailable, uh, but then the Pan-African Masters Consortium in Conference Interpreting and Translation came up. Uh, the University of Ghana, Legon, uh, which is like I told you in West Africa. Um, and that initiative was uh, the brainchild of um, 
some concerned professionals on the African continent who now um, met the African Union. Of course, surprisingly, I'm mentioning the African Union for the first time. The African Union is uh, headquartered in Addis Ababa, uh, but uh, they are about the largest recruiters of conference interpreters on the African continent. And so they met uh, the African Union and um, uh, tabled their complaint about the dearth of uh, conference interpreters on the sub region. And so the AU, along with the EU, and the UN office based in Nairobi, in Kenya, now came up with the initiative of establishing the Pan-African Consortium uh, in conference interpreting and translation. Um, I think the initial budget was about $4 million out of, uh, 4 million pounds, I beg your pardon, out of which the EU was to provide about 3 million pounds um, um, euros and the UN also contributed about a million euro and the program was started that is the conference interpreting and translation it was started in the University of um, Legon in Ghana and uh, that was the program that I attended and we are fortunate to get very seasoned conference interpreters very qualified members of AIG who are committed to holding the professional ethics of the profession. And so we are fortunate to get this uh, quality training. And so that address in a certain way, uh, the gap in training. However, that's not um, the only problem, the tuition in that, uh, for that training is quite high. I remember I had to, when I was going to that school, I had to sell my car because I had no um, bursary, I had no scholarship. I had to sell my car and a number of assets, and yet it wasn't enough for me to survive through the first year out of the, the two years, 24 months for the program. So it was a very difficult time uh, for me there. And what happens is that most students who go there sometimes you know, have to skip classes to go cover a meeting here and there to be able to make uh, to keep body and soul together. Uh, so tuition, uh, was and still is a problem, uh, even for the for attending attending the training. Now you also have administrative interference. Now in some of these regional bodies that I mentioned, sometimes uh, due to one administrative uh, administrative lapse or the other, um, someone who may not necessarily be a qualified conference interpreter is placed in charge of making decisions um, involving the recruitment and the remuneration of conference interpreters. And so you get all sorts of chaotic decisions that are taken and once again, favoritism and nepotism um, will come into play. And so that affects uh, at times the quality of uh, uh, the interpreters recruited, so these grey market operators end up being recruited. But where you have competent or qualified and trained conference interpreter, you don't have this. But uh, in some cases, you really have people who interfere and who even tell the chief interpreter who and who to recruit and who and who not to recruit. And uh, if it's a superior, you have very little uh, option left than um, than uh, to do as you are told. Now, a, another problem, which is a very serious problem for the sub-region is insecurity. Like I did mention, you have terrorist groups all over the place. I think most West African countries have one, some, one form of terrorist groups or the other, with the exception of perhaps maybe just five. So you can see out of 15 member states, we have 10 that are under terrorist attacks or they're under threat of terrorist attack. Uh, that should tell you, uh, for instance, that um, it is a very concerning problem. Uh, for instance, a country might be under security lockdown because there has been an attack. And then of course, which interpreter would like to go to a country that is under attack? So meetings will not be hosted there and nothing will take place in that country. So West Africa is really, 
uh, suffering from uh, the challenge of insecurity. And of course, uh, the professional conference interpreting is not spared these uh, threats and these uh, challenges. Political instability is another problem. You are aware that just last year, last week, um, there was a coup, a coup d'etat in Burkina Faso. And um, I think sometime two days ago, there was an attempted coup in Guinea Bissau. There was um, there were two coups in Guinea Bissau, I believe, over the past one year. Mali uh, is under sanction by ECOWAS. Burkina Faso has just been placed on sanctions. So no meetings, nothing will take, part, will take place in these countries. And these are some of the key member states of um, uh, ECOWAS. So um, while the military junta is in place, no meeting will take part in these countries. Nothing will take part in these countries. And the first thing ECOWAS did is to suspend meetings. That means some colleagues are going to suffer because some of these countries are housing some specialized agencies of ECOWAS or of UEMOA or some other um, sub-regional bodies. And so you can imagine uh, for the period that this country, this country or these countries are under sanction, nothing is holding there. And if you have staff interpreters working there, they also suffer. So political instability really is a very serious problem. And people are beginning to fear the domino effect of coup d'etats because um, there is bad governance in virtually every state. There is poverty, you know, grinding poverty in most of these countries. And uh, so, of course, this affects every other aspect of uh, life. Um, in some cases, the the honorarium, the rates are very, very, very poor, very, very poor. And that can be linked to corruption too. For instance, if you um, are working with some government agencies, I can't just say some of these people know next to nothing about conference interpreting. They believe that once you are bilingual, um, that's all it takes. And so they offer you whatever they want to offer you. And if you try to give them, for instance, AIC rates or acceptable rates, they tell you, hey, but uh, even I don't earn as much in, in six months, so why would you want to charge me that for just one day? And so um, that's a problem that we are, face, that we are facing. And um, the, the government officials in virtually all the countries are cashing in on the level of poverty and then the activities of um, uh, the gray market operators who are willing to accept anything in any case because they know they are not formally trained. And so all they are interested in is the money uh, just to put food on the table. And so some actually accept rates as low as $50 a day and some even $25 a day. It's incredible. So you can imagine if you walk in tomorrow um, as a member of AIC, for instance, and you are talking about, let's say $500 a day, or even $400 or $600. And they look at you like you are some, some um, I mean, some type of criminal. So um, low rate is a problem for we the professionals. Infrastructure, that of infrastructure, of course, because of the poverty, um, most countries have very poor infrastructure. Notably, if you look at what's happening with the advent of COVID-19, uh, now you have to do remote simultaneous interpreting. Internet provision uh, in most cases is very, very poor. It's very poor in most cases. A lot of colleagues have been thrown off meetings because where they live, the internet connection is poor. Um, it's a very big problem, really. It's a very big problem. Um, very, very few places have broadband services. And so you have to depend on your MiFi or your Wi-Fi and um, there could be power outages. Uh, electricity too is a problem. A lot of times colleagues are working remotely and they have to send a message, oh, sorry, my battery is down. Uh, my laptop is going off because uh, we, the electricity has been, uh, I mean, has been cut off. And so we can, I can continue, please give me time. Let me charge my phone. Uh, let me charge my phone. Let me charge my laptop. So this is a problem really 
for conference interpreters on uh, the suppression. However, it's not all doom and gloom because um, there is light at the end of the tunnel. The Pan-African masters in conference interpreting actually stepped in and filled the gap of uh, training. And in fact, I was uh, talking with one of the trainers in December at the meeting, and she said their fear now is with the number of graduates they've turned out so far since 2014, when the university turned out the first set of graduates, um, there is fear of a glut in the market. And they are thinking perhaps of suspending recruitment uh, to make it every other year, because uh, now it's clear that um, the intervention of the EU, the United Nations and the AU is paying off there is a sizable number of trained uh, conference interpreters within the sub-region. So now we have to look for opportunities, but unfortunately some of these opportunities may delay in coming owing to the, re the reasons that I cited above. So I've already mentioned the Pancit intervention, which is a very laudable initiative, um, which has really helped, has gone a long way uh, in churning out a sizable number of conference interpreters. And because of that, there is a growing awareness now, the activities of um, conference interpreters and conference interpreting at, uh, as a profession. So now some bodies are beginning to ask questions. If you go looking for a contract, they ask for your CV, they ask um, which university you've attended, what experiences you've had as a conference interpreter. So this is a very good thing happening uh, for the profession within the uh, West African uh, market and sub-region. Um, you have agencies of regional integration. Now with what is happening because of also the business, uh, the business community and the need to grow uh, businesses in the uh, West African sub-region. Um, many bodies have been formed. Like I told you, the G5 Sahel, even though I wouldn't see that as an opportunity because it was born out of insecurity and the need to address it. But more bodies have been created, more bodies have been, have been established uh, in order to address needs in particular sectors of the economy. And West Africa is still a virgin territory for so many things, businesses and uh, what have you. So we consider this as prospects as the demand for expansion grows. Um, we believe that the opportunity for conference interpreting will also grow uh, within the sub-region. So we believe that this is a very good thing uh, for the community, I mean, for the profession. I've already spoken about the business environment, which is a budding and very promising. And uh, so we believe that with time, um, many will tap into the opportunities in the mining sector, the electricity sector, uh, the water sector, the internet, uh, GSM, and what have you. And as they invest in Africa, opportunities will open up. Now you have cross-border cultural ties, like I did say, and as long as this exists, there will be need for conference interpreting. You have chief, chief domes, um, Emirates that are found across the border. Uh, and so they have to invite their people. Some are in Anglophone, some are Francophone, some are Lusophones, Portuguese speaking, but they have relations across the border. And of course, um, at a formal gathering, uh, definitely uh, you have um, conference interpreters uh, invited to cover that uh, event. Now, the role of AIC. I'm not going to bother you too much with the role of uh, with what AIC is because all of you are colleagues. And so, you know, AIC was established in 1953 uh, to bolster and enhance professionalism um, within the profession. And of course, to become a member of AIC, you know, the mandatory 150 working hours, you know, you have to walk into your A, B, and C languages. Um, you need to show proof of that too. You need to show some contracts um, and then you have to provide sponsors uh, for each uh, language um, that you have as an interpreter and then you could be home and dry. Uh, most importantly for uh, is 
uh, the fact that thanks to this AIC professionals within not only within the um, sub-region, but on the continent at large, um, professionalism is beginning to be uh, at the core of interpreting services. So now some um, agencies, some organizations now are able to tell when a professional is rendering service and when a substandard person is rendering service. So AIC and its um, a professional um, code of professional ethics and professional standards have really, really helped in instilling discipline and restoring order into the profession. Of course, that is not going to bother uh, the gray marketers, uh, but there's a growing number of professionals within the sub-region. I believe that with time, we will reach that critical mass of professionals that is needed to turn the tide around in favor of professionalism. Of course, we know that AIC is also helping with ISO standards. Um, like I did say, there is very poor regulation in virtually every standard, every sector. Um, there is very little concern for the quality of equipment, audio quality. Uh, the, for instance, uh, what the ISO standard for both mobile and fixed boots are. Um, and then the setting, the meeting environment and all this. But today, with the growing number of professionals um, who are largely AIC, all that is changing slightly because now we are able to tell some organizations, hey, you can't cite your boots here, you can't use this type of equipment because they are not ISO, they don't meet ISO standards. So AIC has really helped tremendously in promoting uh, the profession and upholding a uh, professional ethics uh, within the sub-region. Now, the impact is that quality control is assured and um, it uh, brings prestige. Uh, for instance, say you're an AIC member, those who have an idea know that uh, you are really operating at the very top and that whenever they give you any job, they know that you are going to deliver satisfactorily. And that brings increased opportunities as a member of AIC. So, in conclusion, and I hope I've not taken longer than necessary. In conclusion, I believe that um, the best is yet to come for the profession in the West African sub-region. Um, the problem only is that with political instability, with the level of poverty and insecurity, sometimes when you take one step forward, you feel you are taking five steps backward. Um, West Africa, is home to so many epidemics. We had the Ebola crisis in 2014. Uh, healthcare delivery is very poor. And look, all hell can be let loose anytime. We've had colleagues that were stuck that went to cover a meeting in a country, and then there was an attempted coup. And because of that, they were stuck in that country for a month until an arrangement is made to ferry them out of that country. So the, the level of political instability and insecurity is something that um, really needs to be looked at. But then it is not within the purview of um, the conference interpreters to determine. It's a political thing. It's a political crisis um, arising from bad governance, poor decisions, corruption, and what have you, which we believe that if they are not properly checked, uh, would hamper the growth of the profession. But by and large, we believe that um, if you look at how things were at independence, and today we believe that uh, the West African subregion has really come a long way, and that, like I did say, uh, the best is yet to come despite the myriad of challenges. So that is it. I believe I'm done. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you very much to the organizers of this seminar. Merci beaucoup. Muito obrigado. Thank you. Nagodi is in Hausa, one of the prominent languages of um, West Africa. It's, it's uh, spoken in about five West African countries. And so it also means thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Cristiano. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, everyone for your participation and for your kind attention.